they say, you know my favourite line from Italian job? I say, it's not the only supposed to blow the blow. How did you know that? <laughs> I knew what mini skirts were, but I didn't know about the mini cars. <laughs> was what really made the 60s the 60s. Everything was big, bird and stolen. Yes, and there's no way that anybody but a Brit could have written self-preservation society. I said, well, guess again. So I think it's got a big future, as well as a big past. Everything about it, it's almost magical. Hang on a minute, lads. I've got a great idea. Uh... My inspiration for the Italian job, they could be called inspiration, was the desire uh, to write a movie and get out of television. My brother had written a treatment for the BBC about a robbery which takes place in London. I think it was the second play I wrote in about 1965. I just heard about the way that computerized traffic lights were coming into Oxford Street, uh, the whole length of Oxford Street. I thought, well, there's probably an idea here. He wasn't able to get away at the BBC. They said it was going to be far too expensive. And quite clearly, an elaborate robbery in central London was not something that was going to fit into the studios in Shepherd's Bush. And then my brother very nicely bought the whole thing off me, the film rights, and decided to set it in Italy, where there was, I knew, a huge computer-controlled traffic system in Turin. At the same time, I'd thought a lot about the, the character of Charlie Kroger, who was going to be the lead man of the robbers who went down there, and had really sort of based it on Michael Caine as a kind of character that I knew. So that's how it began. I was in Cannes with Ipcris File, and I was at uh, this lunch, and I was sitting next to a guy, and we were talking, and he knew who I was, because he's all a publicity. I said, what do you do? He said, I uh, won't tell you what I do. I'll tell you what I did yesterday. I said, what did you do yesterday? He said, I bought Paramount. <laughs> and it was Charlie Bluedorn. When Charlie Bluthorn acquired, bought Paramount, he appointed a studio head to run the show, and that was Bob Evans, who was the very much the best studio person I ever worked with, and I think a lot of other people thought the same thing. Well, Bob Evans had recently asked me to join him at the studio, and we had been good friends. Without Peter, I would have been out. I needed him, that's how important he was to me. I was the correspondent on the West Coast for the New York Times at the time, and he said, look, I frankly don't know what I'm doing here, so why don't you come join me so there'll be two of us who don't know what we're doing here. And that was an inviting invitation. I really felt there was an opportunity to make things happen. And apparently, I must have done a good job because within the year, they made me head of the company, the whole company worldwide. I can always take it to the Americans. They're people who recognize young talent and give it a chance. Robert Evans, who was head of Paramount at the time, became an important um, part of the whole Italian job story. I was sent to London to close it up, and instead I opened it up. There was the, the usual maze of screenplays, and that one stood out in my mind as being a really interesting piece that had its own energy. Shortly thereafter, I met Troy, who was just this terrific terrific kid at the time. is a, a great-looking uh, character who knew everybody and had a, his own energy. I just think he's terribly talented. And he helped a lot in getting England out of the doldrums of film. I got a message that Bob Evans wanted to meet me, and I went to the Paramount office. It was meant to go up and have a meeting with him about the possibility that Paramount might buy the treatment that I'd given them, which was about 60 pages long. And he, he was very bullish in the elevator about doing the deal before we reached uh, his office on the top floor. The price went up as the elevator went up, that's all I can tell you. But I was intrigued with it. He asked 
um, who I wanted to play the part, and I said, Michael Caine, and he said, well, you know, we've got this guy called Robert Redford. Well, they wanted Robert Redford for everything then, because they always want the flavor of the year in their pictures. I never heard that for years and years and years, and I thought, well, you know, and, and, and Bob, I know Bob Evans very well, you know, and I thought, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, he was thinking in terms of an American. But in view of the fact that it really was written by Troy Kendi Martin with Michael Caine in mind, and since it was a British picture, and it had to be a British picture to have any real reality, it, that never came to anything. He said, well, OK, it's a deal. If you get Michael, we'll go with Michael. And then he said, how much do you want for it? <laughs> Which I didn't expect him. So I said $100,000, and he said, OK, and we'll give you an extra 20000 if you can get Michael involved. If you could tell a story in three lines, you got yourself a hit. Three lines could tell you more than three pages, and he got me between the first and fifth floor. He gave me those three lines, and those three lines became the Italian job. But, Freddie, this job is big. Charlie, you wouldn't even know how to spell big. B-I-G. Big. Once the deal had been made, I went back to write the screenplay, and... It was this point that I met Michael Dealey. I felt confident that he was going to be able to keep the whole business of production working. Talk about prepared. This man is the most prepared producer I think I've ever worked with. He did sort of confess that he said he was too clever for his own good and that he was the architect of his own misfortunes <laughs> by being this, by being too sharp. He's tough. He's really tough. <laughs> he doesn't, Michael doesn't take a lot of prisoners, you know? But he's a good producer, as his record shows. He's a real producer. And I wish I knew many more of them on the way up or down, because that's what you call a producer, Michael Dilley. One of the great things about the project, when I read the script, was it came with an encumbrance, and that encumbrance was Michael Caine, which is wonderful. I pursued Michael over a period, I think, 18 months or so. Before that, I'd asked him, because I'd started Zedcast, this police series, if he would be one of the policemen in that. And I didn't want to do television. I wanted to be a movie actor. And so I didn't do it. So then he wrote a movie part for me. So it went on like that. That's how it went on. Working with Michael Caine was a dream come true. I had seen him in Zulu, fallen in love with him in Zulu. Indeed, he was probably the biggest star in the UK. He had done Alfie, and not only Alfie, but Alfie was the one that everybody remembered him for. Well, you all settled in? Right, we can begin. My name is... Alfie! I got nominated for an Academy Award for Alfie, so I was big time in Britain, because Alfie had been released in America and was a hit there. Little Alfie, which cost under a million dollars, did more business than uh, the biggest pictures primarily that year. Very nice. I think Michael Caine was the perfect choice because he can combine that lovely mixture of mischief. And he can make people laugh without much difficulty if he wants to. And he can be serious if he wants to. I mean, he's, he's a star. He was like the new 60s man. He was everything you could think of. I mean, he was uh, dynamic, witty, working class. He is Charlie Crocker. <laughs> bye bye, Charlie! He came from that kind of rough, tough background and. Uh, you know, he just knew how to, to be a leader with that motley crew. He just slipped into those Dougie Hayward suits and, and the jumpsuits with great ease. He had all that style, and, and yet you knew that he could pull this job off. He was what we call, in the old days, we called a white boy. You know, he was, he was non-violent, just out to get the money. That's all he wanted, to get the money, have a great life, and not, not necessarily go to work meet a lot of beautiful women, get laid and go home. After I read the script, I thought the obvious director for this should be Peter Yates. He showed he knew how to handle cars, as he had done with Robbery, a picture we did together. And the car chase at the front of that was what got him the job on Bullet, and Bullet should have gotten him the job on Italian job. But um, uh, the boss, in this case, Charlie Bluthorn, uh, had a friendship with or feeling for uh, Peter Carlson, and he wouldn't discuss anybody else until Peter was appointed. 
which was, as it turns out, wasn't a bad thing. Well, best I could tell, there were certain social connections that he was making with the uh, chairman of the board uh, that were giving him uh, status within the studio. But Yates still remained in the background as a possible replacement if, if Collison wasn't able to make the grade. He was cheap. Remember, I had a budget <laughs> with a capital B. <laughs> and um, I needed someone hungry, not someone who was looking to buy a new villa. Peter's background was very sad. He was in an orphanage from the time he was about five and a half. His father was a musician, his mother was an actress, and when the marriage broke up, neither of them wanted to take him. I mean, he had quite a difficult time there. Um, so not a lot of parental control, a, a lot of frustrations, I think, probably built up with him uh, with, with, throughout his childhood. And I suppose that all led to really feeling that he wanted to really blow off a lot of steam in his life. When he was in the orphanage, Noel Coward was one of the governors, and he used to come down and visit the children, and he found Peter crying one day in a corner. He sought him out, Noel Coward, when he went there every time because of the sadness in the little boy. And uh, eventually he said to him, had he a godfather? And Pete said, no, he hadn't. So Noel Coward said he would be his godfather. I remember my father saying, he went and used to go to me multiple times when you know, he was getting a hard time, felt really, really low. Noel would cheer him up, take him under his wing, you know, basically tell him it'll be OK and sort of smooth the road for him. When Peter left the orphanage, he went into the theatre, backstage, spot boy, that sort of thing. Then from the stage, he went into television. And then from television, having done quite a few very, very good series, producing and directing, he went into movies. Peter had done a couple of pictures up the junction and penthouse. Just to give him a bit more experience, I thought we should do another picture before Italian job, which just wasn't set to start shooting for months. And and uh, Peter Yates and I had written a script, which I took to Paramount, and they said it for that. Michael got him to direct a movie called Long Days Dying First, which was a small anti-war movie that Michael Dealey was producing, and I think he wanted to watch Peter and see how he took on this very, very difficult project in the middle of winter, all on location, very cold, very miserable. And I think he must have been impressed with the way he did it. Some people used to tread quite warily around Peter Carlson. Um, I think they didn't quite know what was going on in his mind. And he relied a lot on charm. He had a great deal of charm, which when he put it on, he put it on. But he could switch it off darn quickly if he felt like it. But I didn't have any problems with him, really. Um, compared to some of the directors that I've worked with, he's an absolute pussycat. Peter had a tremendously wild streak in him. I always felt he was born too late. He should have been a pirate or a Viking. There was a sense of life in him that if he wasn't on the edge, it wasn't worth living. His wildness took on all sorts of forms, which included uh, literally driving me across the lawn and through our front window and parking in the front room one night in a white Rolls Royce just because I'd said he didn't actually bring me to the door. He had a rather fiery attitude. That's the prerogative of a director. And if he's a good director, you take the blows and give him the embrace. Peter was quite eccentric, and the best thing to do was always to say yes to him. He would fly off the handle if, you know, you didn't do what he wanted. I did sit in his chair once, which is absolutely, apparently, he discussed with me that you never do that and sit in the director's chair. So I didn't do that again. Oh, he had a temper. <laughs> but I was never at the end of that. It lasted seconds. You know, he'd scream, shout, do everything. And then he was back to the happy chat we all loved dearly. It was the 60s, you know, I was in discotheques every night. I didn't give a toss whether anybody didn't like him or not. You know, I liked him. I didn't buy him for his personality. I liked what he did. I mean, I wasn't very experienced myself then. I'd only made about four or five movies. But I could tell from what he was doing that he knew what he was doing. So, so I was quite happy with him. We come here to pay our respects to Great Aunt Nelly. She brought us up properly and taught us loyalty. 
Michael Caine, of course, being attached, he was the star. But one of my concerns was that people might think of this because it's a, it was going to be a pretty light-hearted picture as a remake of Alfie or Alfie 2 or something. So it seemed essential to have somebody there balancing it. Goodbye, Mr. Bridger. <laughs> no, Carl, I thought it was the most genius idea ever. I mean, to make him the heavy, the courtly heavy holding court in a cell was absolutely a stroke of genius. And, and that was a difficult role. I mean, it was a role that was supposed to represent an individual that had the power over the whole criminal fraternity, the whole prison. It had to be someone with a real stature to be able to pull that off. I didn't see Noel Coward in the role. I was thinking of Nicol Williamson, who would have given uh, the role a much, he would become more of a thug and it would have been much more menacing. But that was where Peter Collinson was going with that and with the casting of Benny Hill and the rest of it. So he was looking for a much lighter and kind of simple. He was going with the flow of the comedy that was basically there. What's that lot over there? To the driver's seat. They're the lot that smashed up my cars. Practice makes perfect, Mr. Bridger. Peter Collinson was very keen on the idea of having Noel Card once the idea came up. He saw Noel really, I think, as a father figure. And so, with anyone's father, the biggest thing you want to do in life is sort of prove yourself to them. So, for him, the, you know, the biggest achievement that he could really get was to have Noel within a film. Noel Cow was a piece of, a piece of history. Um, Only is a piece of history. A real gentleman. On the set of Italia Job, Noel Coward was treated like a god. Peter had always called him the master because that was what the theatrical crowd called him. And he insisted that everybody would address Noel on the set as the master. But Peter made it sound very natural. Look this way, master. Look that way, master. Thank you, that's a rap, master. That's a, 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 set, a really setting a level of respect and just to show how much my father respected Noel. And he wanted everyone to show that respect because Noel was just a huge figure. Noel Coward was embarrassed. He'd say, oh, dear boy, you know, you know don't... don't <laughs> dear boy. <laughs> dear boy. <laughs> Go like that. Uh, but Peter Collinson insisted till the end of the film that we called him the master. That's right. For why, Keats? For why? I was introduced to Sir Noel, and uh, he said, oh, pleasure. And he said, um, he said, um, are you related to my Aunt Nellie? And I said, yes, I am. I said, uh, my Aunt Nellie is Nellie Bly, and she lives in Fort Worth, Texas, and she works at a fruitcake factory. <laughs> He doubled over laughing, <laughs> and he said, oh, keep her, keep her, Peter. I think you should keep her. <laughs> Noel and I became great friends, and for 12 or 13 weeks, I did the most English thing I ever did. Every Wednesday, I had dinner with Noel at the Savoy Grill. And so it was absolutely wonderful. And him and Graham Payne, who was in the picture, and his secretary, Coley. And I developed this friendship uh, uh, with, with Noel Coward, who I adored. I thought he was wonderful. Everyone was in awe of the fact that Noel Coward was in prison. <laughs> Did you hear that? And for some reason, everyone's work picked up a bit because they were playing opposite Noel Coward. For some reason, I was on the set every day because I was near Noel Coward. And it was exciting, quite frankly, having him on. I know you're in here, Charlie. There's no use hiding. There were two meetings you had customarily. Meeting number one was, these are the talent that's available. Meeting number two, well, what girls do you want? We felt that well, even though it was very much a British picture, we should also try to have an American, because it might broaden its appeal. And that's how we cast Maggie Bly, who was Paramount's suggestion, who was actually perfect for us. My relationship with uh, Charlie Croker, it seemed, was um, a little bit more, you know, developed, let's say, in the script because of having the love scene. He was in the shower. <laughs> I remember the day we shot that and Michael was freezing and they had this little nude piece on him. And we actually, you know, held each other and kissed and all that romance was there. And you just felt like they were you know, a real couple, even though she was very open-minded. She's a smart cookie, that one, I thought, because she knew how to keep him. She's very clever. Give him his way, and she'd get everything. <laughs> You're the last person I expected to see, Lorna. Oh, Charlie, I've been counting the days. There were other scenes in it which actually added to her character and which showed a kind of 
a deeper, deeper kind of resonance between them. But I think Peter was working on a broader canvas. Peter Collinson had turned my character into a dolly bird. The plans changed. Uh, why, Charlie? Why? Because you're a liability. I think Troy Kennedy Martin had written uh, a script that had a harder edge to it. I would imagine that people who knew his work were quite surprised at the Italian job. Peter Collinson, the director, he wanted it to be more, you know, happening in London and, uh, you know, more of the comedy part. Well, look at me, you stupid bastards. He saw it more of, a, of an entertainment film than, if you like, a very hard, rough, sharp edge sort of robbery film. It was the 60s, for Christ's sake. We didn't want to do political messages. You know, Vietnam was to come. It took itself rather too seriously, so in order to deal with that, of course, we cast some interesting people like um, Irene Handel and Fred Emney, Benny Hill. It changed the whole tone of the piece. Here, wait till you see them Italian birds. Are they big? I like them <laughs> big. My Benny Hill character was a guy who was a sort of obsessed by being a train driver. He did model trains and that sort of stuff. But Collins dreamed up the whole idea that he was sort of attracted by fat women. I winced at that and various other things in the film. It kind of just rolled in this incorrect way from one end to the other. The kind of chauvinism about women, you know, but Benny Hill just bursts out of the screen and gives it this simpler message. And of course, I mean, it's very funny. Pity people aren't as lovely as flowers, isn't it? Take your flowers, get in the car. Betty Hill was a great joy um, to have in the picture. Um, there's so much skill, so much talent. You would arrive at the set and you'd realise that you would be sitting there for quite a long time. And the only real pleasure would be to be in the caravan with Benny Hill, who would regale us with these wonderful stories for hours on end. As youngsters, again, you crack jokes to comics and think they're very funny. And to Benny Hill's eternal credit, he always laughed at the gag. But you knew damn well he'd heard it a thousand times before. Benny always disappeared. I mean, we'd all go out and have a drink, we'd all go and have dinner or something, you know, in, in Turin. So Benny disappeared. Very inscrutable person. I mean, we never knew what he did when he was having time off in Italy. He would just disappear. But he was such a good person to work with. It's like the black hole of cold cutter in here. Shout it, Arthur. We are about to do a job in uh, Italy, and I would like to introduce you all to each other. I played Rosa, and most of the time, I've got to be honest, I think, I think most of the gang had about, we had about ten lines between us, so everybody <laughs> was struggling for recognition. We were all kids being kids, and it was, it was joyous. In the traffic jam, I drove the low loader and cut off one of the the corners of the square. I do love the film for the cast that it has. And if you watch the film, it's got every wonderful car from the 60s in it you could possibly have. Now, that very much was driven by the Salamonis, who ran a small little British car firm, and it was very much a sports car firm. So they sort of fell to the task of, can you find some performance cars for the film? I was running around London trying to find the cheapest cars in the world. I got the cheapest DB4 convertible, Aston Martin. I got the cheapest two E-type Jaguars that were available. And certainly everything was big, borrowed and stolen. Uh, the Land Rover, the minibus. The minibus is my old go-karting van. The Daimler, the coach. Just everything you see in the film, we supplied. They did a very good job finding these things. And in the end, also, one of the drivers was played by David Salamone. At that point, I was an actor and a driver and a car supplier. You better put your foot down, put your foot down, we lose them easy. An old friend of mine, Barry, who I'd been go-kart racing with when we were kids, I managed to get him a job as driving one of the other minis. Here, make a wish. My original part was in the blue car. We arrived on the first day of the shoot and Richard had taken the blue overalls. Hello, lads. Hello, Charles. I read the script. The white car had three more words than the blue one did, which meant it had seven words, which wasn't too bad. We were standing there. I was in the white overalls, Dave was in the red ones, and Richard was in the blue ones, and they shot the first scene. Richard was kicking me from behind, saying, you know, we're in the wrong colours. Anything else? Right, away you go. And after that, that was the end of the story. They weren't about to reshoot 
an entire scene on behalf of our three chinless wonders. And so I became Chris. You're meant to use your brakes, Chris. Te terribly sorry, Charles. We were told to put posh accents on in the film by Peter Collinson. Uh, it was his idea, something he wanted to carry through the, the film. I don't know whether we carried it off. Dominic, we get into the minutes behind the piazza. I think we slotted into that rather well, actually. I think so. <laughs> considering, we, considering we were East End Oaks as well, not Chinless Wonders. And what more could you want to do? I mean, you were 24, 23, 22, in the sunshine, with 300 beautiful extras. 200 were lovely girls. And what more could you want to do? And, 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 and be in the film business? T to my mind, it was pure heaven. Pure heaven. <laughs> Hey, he's going to do a job in Italy. Well, I hope he likes spaghetti. They serve it four times a day in the Italian prisons. We had to decide where we were going to shoot the picture. It obviously had to be in Italy. Um, and we didn't want to go near Rome because it's far too congested and too many people are shot in Rome. So we tried it up in the north and Disney went off to Milan to have a look at it. I spent about three weeks in Milan. By the time I'd come back with the photos, occasion pictures and ideas and discussed it with Peter, it was apparent that there wasn't enough going for it. The Italian authorities pointed out that as much as they would like to help, that really to bring the, the traffic to the standstill in Milan, which was probably the busiest city in the whole of, whole of Italy, would be asking a bit too much, even of Italian generosity. And they suggested, therefore, that we should try Turin. This is the city of Turin the industrial capital of Italy, the most modern in Europe. The perfect place to shoot a film is in a dictatorship, if you can find one, and also in a city which is a virgin city, which no one's ever filmed in before. A, it's original on the screen, and B, the police and everybody else don't know what a, how wretched it is to have a film unit cluttering the place up. Turin hadn't had a lot of recognition for movies, you know? It's not like Rome, there was always a unit shooting in Rome or Paris, you know? Turin was very pleased to get it. I had a friend, and the friend happened to be the most important man in Italy for what I needed anyway. His name was Johnny Agnelli, who owned Fiat, and Fiat owned Turin. I went over to Turin, spent a weekend with the Agnelli family and with Johnny, and they gave me the entire city to use for nothing. Anything we wanted, we had a free stage with thousands of cars. Fortunately, I had a close friend, David Harlick, who was friendly with Agnelli, and he asked him to, on my behalf, to, to extend his good wishes to us. And Agnelli agreed, and he passed the word down, and we had the greatest cooperation I've ever seen. Agnelli, the head of this vast empire, reads the script, it amuses him, and then he summons Michael Dealey to come to meet him in Turin, and, and also summons the chief of police to come up from Rome, where he was on some sort of conference, and gets the two of them together and says, now to the chief of police, I want you to be as much, you know, give as much cooperation for the making of this film in this city as possible. And the result was that we got the police on our side, which is a huge step forward. Directly, Agnelli said yes, the city said yes. Yes, it was all it was a phone call. A phone call did what agents couldn't do in a year, he did in one minute. The getaway. This will be done in three Mini Coopers, driven by Chris, Tony, and Dominic. Well, Mini is a rather foreign word to Americans. I knew what Mini skirts were, but I didn't know about Mini cars too much. The Mini was the perfect car for this film because it was part of the vision of one had of the 60s. You know, you had these, the, this young, optimistic crowd. Uh, it was, to a certain extent, almost classless. We were all working class guys. It was a very cheap car, cheap new car. It's not like these posh minis you see now. Uh, and so it worked for us, and they were small, and they were inexpensive, and we were going to have to smash up a lot more. It was cheeky. It was quick as hell. It was full of character. It was very British. Three of them in red, white, and blue. So obviously, made the statement about us and them, the British and the Italians. It's perfect. Go! 
You three take the minis along the V road and keep the speed down, OK? Well, if I was the studio executive today, what I would have said is, what a great deal. We'll get the Mini Cooper company to put up the whole budget for the picture. We'll get a few hundred free minis, and I'll get one delivered to me. But in those days, I, I, I don't remember, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was no deal at all with Mini. BMC, who at that time, I think, owns and, and were producing the minis, gave absolutely no help to the film. I cannot believe how just dis disinterested they were. Here we were, about to make the greatest commercial for cars that probably could ever be made. And this was going to be shown all over the world. And the, the minis were obviously the heroes of the film. And while any other company, one knows, would have gone out of their way to give us every facility. They wouldn't make any deals with it except for three cars which they sold us at trade price. All the rest of them, 30 or whatever number it was, um, we had to buy in retail. Mr. Bridger, this is important. Four million dollars, Europe, the common market, Italy, the Fiat car factory. In contrast to the, uh, the behaviour of British Motor Corporation, Fiat um, offered everything. The cooperation was, was, was amazing. Fiat were more than happy to contribute their cars, and in fact, Fiat were almost bending over backwards to try and get Fiat's used instead of Minis. Blimey, bloody Grand Prix. I nearly wanted to change the Minis to Fiat's um, and accompany that offer with as many cars as we wanted to crash. Michael agreed, and I agreed, that, it, I mean, it was just the whole British nature of the whole thing. Uh, would have been sort of betrayed by having Fiat's in there, and, and Yelly uh, didn't press the point. But he did give us a lot of other cars, um, the Lancia's, the police cars he gave us, um, a lot of cars for crowd scenes, particularly the great sort of blocking up of the main square. One of the nicest things that they did was they gave my father a Ferrari Dino at the end of the film for actually shooting it, which I must say he did then write off several years later, so I haven't been able to inherit it, unfortunately. But, yeah, we're, we're super people at Fiat and, and held a great amount of influence in Italy and opened a lot of doors. We went and saw Johnny and Yelly and said, can we drive the cars on the roof of Fiat? He said, sure. Because we realised the name Fiat was on the top. <laughs> but he let us drive minis on the roof. He was just terrific for a, you know, for a guy who was just doing it for a friend of his. There isn't a man in America today who could do it, including the President of the United States what Johnny and Ellie could do. With all the cars we had, um, particularly the Minis, we'd have to hurtle through the city and doing all these stunts in, indoors and outdoors and down steps and so on. We need a really good team of people. Anybody who loves and knows the Italian job will realise that the cars are great stars in it. And in order to make them great stars, you had to have great stunt drivers and they got the best, Remy Julian and his team. When I had this first contact with the Italian job, it meant Paramount, Michael Caine, all those things. So it was something quite huge. And when I read the script of the scenario, I understood that it was something very important. Remy Julian was absolutely divine. He was a marvelous person, great sense of humor. If the Italian job has any star, it's Remy. Remy is the greatest. Remy was the greatest stunt driver. He was the most imaginative. He was technically the most brilliant. He was unbelievably courageous. They wrote a list of all the things they expected me to do, but asked me if it was possible I could make suggestions. He actually contributed a lot of the stunts himself. He said, I can do this, I can do that, do you want it? He took on board what suggestions there were in the script and kind of really embellish them in every possible way. I think there was a sense when Remy Julian came on board that anything was possible. I remember dr driving home one day and I saw the Mini being tested, you know, and it came to traffic lights, the traffic lights turned red, and somehow Remy threw his body back and the Mini sat up and begged with four wheels up, and then when it changed to green, he, lurched forward and the Mini dropped and he drove off again. Yeah. And I thought that was quite one of the most impressive things I've ever seen in my life. In that era, the, and I might get into trouble for this, but the British stunt department were always wider than they were tall and would do anything you asked them 
at the drop of a hat, they'd get in the car and drive it through that wall. But they never practiced it. They never did anything about it. This suddenly, Remy Julian brought science to the whole thing. People think, oh, he's a stunt man. He goes in and smashes himself. Everything is worked out to the nth detail. You know, the, the stunt men, you very rarely find stunt men get killed or injured. Very, very rarely. It's because of the care they take. And Remy was a genius at that with weights, velocity, and everything. The team Remy Julien was my ex motocross engineer, Raphael Olivetti, who was in charge of transportation and logistics. And I had young guys with me, very clever pilots, who were taught how to do stunts. We were the core of the team. They were wonderful. They were so clever with those cars. They almost turned them into people. They were like little toys. They were like cat and mouse. It was like a cartoon, you know? It was like Tom and Jerry or something. He managed them to, to give them a personality of their own and a grace. So it was very, something very extraordinary about Remy. Of course, there was an irony in the fact that this was really a film about Britain and Italy. And the stars, apart from Michael Caine, were these little cars, British cars. And our stunt drivers actually could hardly speak English. They were French. But um, hand signals, you know, you got the idea. And the, the, the classic thing, which is two dinky toys. Yeah. <laughs> You get the dinky toys out, and you go bup, 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 like this, and that's what you do. It was completely exceptional to be, let's say, chosen to work on this movie. It was extremely encouraging and motivating. Remy Julian, to this day, is known as the best car stunt team in the world. Lamborghini Miura had just come out. It was the latest thing. You couldn't even get one. At a recent event, a um, question answer event, about the talent job, a man got up and said, I hate you. And I said, well, OK, why? He said, well, that brilliant car, that gorgeous orange Lamborghini, you smashed it to pieces. It really was a thing when it came out with people going, oh, my god, look what they've done. Lamborghini going over there, everybody going nuts, especially in Italy. <laughs> and I sort of soothed him by pointing out that, in fact, what he'd seen driving in was a perfectly good car. What he saw coming out was an appalling old wreck from a previous accident, and there's no engine in it or anything. It was just literally a piece of crumpled orange Lamborghini body. Lamborghini themselves supplied the rolling chassis with no engine in, which is the car that's thrown over the cliff, and you can see that when it tumbles down the cliff. So no, no we hadn't actually damaged any Lamborghinis. That would have been an expensive trick. Cheerio, lads! Take your voice down, Crocker. You're not out yet. Sorry, sir. When it came to uh, looking for a location for a prison, Kilmainham came up immediately. Kilmainham Jail was a big IRA prison jail for the British, you know, and all these things had gone on there were rather terrifying. It had significance to my family in as much as during the Troubles, that's where the young men were taken by the British Army and shot, and their bodies were put outside the wall. My grandmother lived opposite the jail, and she was one of the ladies who used to come across and try and clean up these young boys and make them less horrific looking for their mothers to come and claim their bodies. That was the most extraordinary experience, because you wound up with 200 Irish extras going did little out of England. They're all Irish. You know, in Calmain and jail, which is the symbol of kind of British oppression in Ireland, you know? And I thought that was extraordinary of the Irish to do that, you know? And they didn't... No one said, we're not doing it, or I'm walking out. They all did it. One of the problems was the staircase. It's a very old-fashioned iron see-through staircase. You can see the ground below you, and it does throw you off balance. And Noel did have problems walking down it. He was getting on, and he did have difficulty. 
remembering lines and things like that. Outside of that prison, it was our first day of shooting in, in, uh, in London. And all I recall was that the car was huge. And since I'd learned to drive in the fields of Texas in a truck at age nine years old, I felt really proud of myself. And then when Michael got in, it was so much fun because I knew he couldn't drive. <laughs> I never had enough money to buy a car until I started making movies. I never had enough money for driver's lessons, let alone buying a bloody car. One of the interesting things about that particular shot was that uh, they had the camera mount right next to me outside of the door. And next to the camera was this giant head that could just fit in. And its chin was right there on the ledge of the windowsill. And it was Peter Collinson. <laughs> And so I'm trying, that scene when you see, I'm, there's the camera, I'm trying so hard not to get into Michael's light. But Peter there, I kept getting a case of the giggles. <laughs> I think about it now and it, it makes me laugh. This car belongs to the Pakistani ambassador. The ambassador of Pakistan, it was one of my father's customers at the garage, and the car happened to be in for some work. And that is the car that was used to pick Michael Caine up from the prison. Typical, isn't it? I've been out of jail five minutes and already I'm in a hot car. <laughs> in that scene, when Michael Caine comes back to collect a car, I played a kind of ritzy car manager. And Peter Collinson asked us if we would improvise around the main theme. Michael said, great, let's go. And I was really pleased because it was going to give us a chance to do something that we hadn't really found with the dialogue. And that's what happened. Um, I was just thinking, maybe it needs a little more air yeah. through the second carburetor. Oh, do you think so? Yeah, listen. Yeah. Yes, maybe all right. Yeah. So we improvised the scene, and it was just like tennis. It was lovely. I would just lob something at him and he would lob it straight back and we would tread on each other's dialogue and it had life and it got a little bit of vitality into the scene that it needed and it worked. Yes, you must have uh, shot an awful lot of tigers, sir. Yes, I used a machine gun. <laughs> What happens in the scene at the Lancaster is that he arrives and he thinks we're just going to have a little quiet dinner with the two of us. And, for, and then, of course, he opens the door and I have gathered all of these darling girls. Well, shut the door, Charlie. You're going to cause a terrible draft. <laughs> he looks like the cat with the cream across his lip, you know. Ladies? <laughs> it was fun because that is what was happening in London and everywhere then, you know, it was all free love. Good to see you, Charlie. Sweet job. <laughs> Those girls were so sweet and we all bonded with each other and, uh, you know, we were ganging up with Michael, tickling him, <laughs> stuff like that. And uh, it was a lot of fun. And the thing about Michael Caine, the way we bonded was he likes to do it in one take. I like to do it in one take. We're just kind of quick like that. Very nice, very nice. Um, now, what would you like? <laughs> Everything. My favorite scene in a movie, let me, let me think now, because there's so many of them. I mean, I mean, my favourite line in the movie is you're only supposed to blow the bloody doors up. Who do you go to in the council to go and have permission to set off explosives? Well, basically, they didn't even go and ask permission. They snuck the van onto the green, filled it full of explosives and blew it to pieces. Five. Unfortunately, very quickly, we were hearing car sirens, police sirens coming. Four. First assistant, because it's a wrap. And everybody scooted because it threw windows out on houses round about and it was a hell to pay. Three. When I wrote it, I never thought that anyone would quote it 40 years down the line. Two. Well, you're just wondering whether you want to go and see the movie when it comes out, let alone remember a line for 50 years. One. Go. You're only supposed to blow the bloody doors off. Having got over the shock, we all, of course, all burst out the laughing, uh, which is what it, the audiences I've noticed 
all do now. They say, you know my favourite line from Italian job? I say, it's not, you're only supposed to blow the floor. How did you, how did you know that? Did you? <laughs> Would we uh, wear stockings over our heads? Oh, no need for you to. Oh, I'd like that. Billy's character, I always thought, would be the first to rush in and try and help and get his, uh, get his hands on the fat lady because he was obsessed with fat women. Dory Dorita, the wonderful actress that we had, she didn't mind at all, but Benny was terrified of doing it. I kept saying, Benny, get your face in, get your face. He wouldn't. Of course, I wouldn't want to get Matron into trouble. Not that way, anyway. <laughs> She's <laughs> big, big. I thought the idea of him lusting after fat women was um, rather perfect, true Benny Hillary. And it felt like Benny Hill. Obviously tongue in cheek, but it, it, it felt right. It was incredibly politically incorrect. Others might have felt that um, it was rather too vulgar, but um, you know, vulgarity, not such a terrible thing. And nowadays, I think the younger audience, uh, the kind of particularly the laddie shorts, are very tolerant about all that. But in the 60s, I think they wouldn't, they just would have thought that was not on. Pretty car. One of the things that caught Michael's attention uh, when he was thinking about the film was the fact that instead of killing people in the film, we were destroying cars. Paid for? He heard me say at some point something I'd forgotten, which was that people get much more upset when they see an Aston Martin being destroyed and thrown over a cliff than it would be if the Mafia had killed somebody. It was the opposite of what was going on there, where people were being murdered in thrillers all over the place, a sort of pornography of death, and we just were killing off manufacturing symbols. Because when you watch someone being killed in a movie, you know he's not being killed. But when you saw that Aston Martin go off a cliff, you knew it was a real one. Just before they shot, Peter said, oh, yes, I know. When the Aston goes over the cliff, I want it to burst into flames. After the two E-types were crushed by the big digger, it proceeded to pick up the Aston Martin to throw it over the cliff. And unfortunately, at that point, the special effects exploded. There was only one Aston Martin, and that had been destroyed in the first go at it. And we had no car to do the shot again. You just lost him his insurance bonus. So I went to Milan, I drove around virtually all night, and eventually found a Lancia Flaminia convertible, which luckily was silver, it was the right color, had a black hood. And that is the car that's thrown down the cliff. You can see it in the film, but you have to kind of know. You know, there was no time for, for laughs on that. I mean, we've got to get this shot, and we've got to get this today, and, and we're losing the light. I had just arrived, and I was on uh, L.A. time. And uh, at lunch, I had no idea it was a two-hour lunch. And everybody's pouring, Raffalone is pouring me, uh, you know, wine, and I'm drinking this wine. Well, after it was over with, and they were going to do some of the biggest crashes and everything, I was, like, falling asleep. I have a picture of myself falling asleep, and Raff is looking at me, you know. He was wonderful. I had the most wonderful time on this film. I, I think it's one of the best times I ever had. When it came to the traffic jams, I really thought that they would have to fake them and use studio techniques. I went out every day with 100 cars and about three or four sets of traffic lights, phony traffic lights, and we'd just draw up in the corner and we'd create real traffic jams. Italy's a bit chaotic anyway. What the devil is happening? It's another traffic jam. It gets worse every day. A lot of people didn't notice. <laughs> the most interesting traffic jam was the one we created in the Piazza Reale. We just pulled a truck across each exit, um, an electrical truck. And they're all British trucks, but nobody could see all four exits at the same time, so they didn't know this conspiracy was going on. And the traffic just came and piled up and piled up, and the noise was unbelievable. I was fortunate I was sat on top of this tall building. Nobody saw the cameraman. If they had, we'd have been lynched. When we got a break, I used to sort of stroll around and try and chat to the Italians. And when you strolled down, you saw people eating food. I even saw a couple making love. It was thrilling because it was a first. And to think we got the whole city going for us for nothing. Right, put your helmets on. We, in fact, hired two different teams, 
uh, one for the driving and one for the actual robbery. And it was a stunt team called Havoc. And the, it was led by Derek Ware and very good experienced people who managed to make it look tough without hurting anyone. My role as stunt arranger and also as the character Rosa uh, were intertwined because uh, Peter decided it would be a good idea to have somebody around as a sort of safety expert as well as devising uh, the robbery itself. And, uh, Peter said, I want it to look very, very British. You know, they're not going in with guns, there's going to be a smoke bomb, and they've just got to set about everybody. He said, what do you reckon we should use? And I said, well, as far as I understand it, the pickaxe handle is the, uh, is the favourite heavyweight weapon for, uh, for the English criminal. You've got to understand, the English criminal at that time, it was almost unknown for any of them to have guns. And he said, right, that's just what I want, terrific. And he said, well, what are they going to do? I said, well, they can knock people off motorbikes, smash windscreens and all the rest of it. In fact, that was the toughest stunt I had to do on the picture, smashing in that windscreen. <laughs> I was hitting it and hitting it, it just wouldn't shatter. In the end, we put a nail through the, the pickaxe handle, and that was how, how I got that windscreen to shatter, after about 14 takes, I think. <laughs> bring it up, bring it up, where's my torch? Where's my bloody torch? There is one line in the film that everybody asks me about, and it's when Michael Caine pulls a crowbar out from under the bed in his apartment and says, Hazel, Hazel, my lovely, out you come. I was always mentioned, or I had a photo placed somewhere in every one of Pete's movies. For luck. And may I raise my glass to Senor Altabani and his most beautiful wife? To thank him for his hospitality. <laughs> I had a cameo role with Raph Filoni in The Italian Job. And uh, it came about when I was at home at the hotel and a car drew up and somebody jumped out and said, quick, quick, your husband needs you to do something in the movie. And I was so thrilled, absolutely thrilled. So I got my glamorous evening suit dashed out to the set, got made up, hair done, arrived on, and uh, Peter said, oh, thank goodness you're here, which made me feel full of joy. And he said, the agents here keep sending me tall, dark, elegant Italian models with a dinner scene, and I'm looking for a small, blonde scrubber. So I, I swallowed my uh, feeling of anger at being so <laughs> insulted and got down and did the scene, because it was with Raffaloni. <laughs> Working in the city of Turin was complicated. Everything was complicated. With those small cars going everywhere, like on the roof of the aviation museum, in sewers, in rivers, in the arcades. It was incredible to watch the, the, the car sequences. You could not. I mean, it was like a magnet. You knew that something exciting was going to happen, and you were drawn to go and see it. When I took Peter around the locations and he saw the staircase, said, that's marvellous, we'll have him come down that staircase. So then we had to get uh, permissions, of course, that was a, in a very lovely old palazzo. In Italian, a, a car is a machina, a machine is a machina. And when the unit went to shoot in the palazzo with priceless artefacts, they said, we were coming in with a few machine. And because we were making a movie, um, the authorities very often thought it was just a camera. And they nearly had kittens when, when the three minutes turned up driving over their carpets, down the staircases and so on. When they went through and then down the steps and I thought, oh my God, I've never seen stunts like this before. And that was the first time I thought maybe we've got something here. Dans les arcades, évidemment, la production in the arcades, the production was paying every shop to compensate for the problems of shooting there. I'm afraid our Italian compatriot wasn't very honest, and he didn't really tell the shopkeepers until the very last minute that the cars were going to go down the arcades. But when they found out, well, one or two of them got very uppity, and I also saw perhaps a 
Dans toutes ces arcades où on passait, il y a un commerçant. Among the shops, one owner wanted more money. OK, we stop everything. A huge shoot. With 300 extras, cars all over the place. It was terrible. C'était terrible. By this time, I mean, we put up neon strips and flowers and all sorts of things to dress the arcades in. But on the day, they made it impossible and we had to pull out. Now, how'd you go around? Look at that bloody exit. We can't go around here all night. A typical example of why we had to have the best was the jump across the two roofs. We did that in the Fiat factory, where there were a lot of flat roofs. And uh, we had to dress in the rooftops with chimney pots, and we dressed in a cafe down below, so you could see suggestion of a street down there. Souvent, on me demande, ah, quelle est la cascade favorite? Very often, people ask what is my favorite stunt, and I'd say that the jump between the two Fiat factory roofs must be the one, because it was emotional, because it was difficult. I was very nervous, because that was 30 or 40 feet up. It was so hard to suggest and sell it to the production. There was a risk attached to it, and I was warned that as a producer I would be held responsible. I'd be slapped straight into jail in Italy and tried to talk my way out. So instead of doing that, I had a car waiting there in case the thing went wrong and a plane at the airport just to get out of the country. So I'd rather argue about it from outside the country than inside an Italian jail. When we went to see the place, it had eight floors. It was a jump of 24 meters to get onto the other side. This meant 110 or 115 kilometers per hour. They said, no, no, it is too dangerous. But it was so wonderful that I insisted and insisted and insisted. They practiced it on the ground. They had to get the angle of the ramp uh, to be put on the edge of the roof so they could get enough height to clear. Avant. Just before the jump, Peter Collinson, who was very nervous, told us, when everything is done, I will climb on the roof with bottles of whiskey and we celebrate. I told him, sorry, I don't like whiskey, I only drink champagne. I remember sort of watching the cars leaping the building and thinking, my goodness me. So I said to Remy, I said, God, I said, I, I, I watched that bloody hell, I said, I, I said, I, I was, my heart was in my mouth. He said, Michael, he said, it's mathematics. He said, the car weighs so much, it's going at so much speed, it's going to go so... There's never any question. She don't think I would get in a car, but it's going to fall on the ground, do you? I said, well, I didn't know that when I saw it. I thought you were just saying, to hell with this, let's see if we can make it. We did the jump, cheers from the crowd, and who do I see climbing to the roof with his jacket full of bottles of champagne? Peter Collinson. And we had some champagne on the roof to celebrate the jump. On the screen it looked fairly smooth and easy, but in fact it was pretty nerve-wracking. One of the good things about the way the picture was put together by Troy was that it was very tight structure. You can write a scene and, and it's a terrific scene, but later you can see that it's going to get in the way of the action or something like that, and very reluctantly you'll discard it. There were times when Collinson would do something um, which actually did get in the way of the action. <laughs> came up with an idea, which he shot very prettily, very nicely, of the minis and police cars doing a sort of dance. So I saw some of the shooting, I thought, this can't possibly work. This is going to be terrible. I was wrong. And it was very pretty, um, but it was designed to be cut into the chase. It just slowed the whole thing down. I liked the Blue Danube sequence very much. I thought it was um, a, a bit of fantasy in the middle of all the real, real life stuff. I thought it was absolutely wonderful. I'd it was a crying shame, because we would have loved to see everything. But it was a bit out of context in the film. It just was the wrong pace. Uh, we were hurrying to get to the end of the picture. And when I wanted to cut it, um, I had to support Bob Evans, who agreed that it wasn't the right thing at the right time. Bob Evans simply said that the Blue Danube sequence was directorial masturbation and should come out. 
I shot the sewer sequence in a, a, a new piece of sewer that was being built at uh, Coventry. We only had one day to do the shoot, because after that, the sewer was going to be open. I wanted to make the car turn a complete circle. The first run in the Mini, I thought, well, I must see exactly what it is. So I sat alongside Remy, and I was astonished with what Remy did with that car. And I was very excited, I can tell you. So we did it once, twice, three times. We nearly managed it. In the end, we didn't make it, because on the floor there was some water remaining. It was wet, which meant a lack of grip. We almost did it. We managed to get on the top, but we couldn't finish the loop. The car fell once on its roof and once on its side. The third time it was going perfectly. But it hit a ledge we hadn't noticed in the roof of the sewer. It came down very, very hard on it on that was the end of the car. That is my biggest regret, because I'm certain we could have done the full turn if we had time to clean the floor. Another example of Remigilien's skill and his team's skill was driving the minis into the back of the bus. It was so difficult to convince the production to do it. I had to fight, to insist. Get the wheels in line, get the wheels in line with it! And then slam your brakes on or we'll be in the cabin. You literally had two to three inches either side of the Mini as it came into the bus through to the back. So the individual needing to wave the Minis in was taking a huge chance. I mean, you were two inches the wrong way, and you would literally probably have lost your legs with one of the minutes. It would have literally just rubbed you down the side of the cage. I wasn't too pleased later when I heard that Peter had um, been on the bus himself. He was the one that stood at the edge of that bus as those cars came hurtling into the coach. It was him who wanted to do it. And they were saying, he's crazy, he's crazy. And it's true, he was a bit crazy, but very confident at the same time, because that was very dangerous. And when Michael Dealey found out, the producer, he was fuming because the danger he was in. And if they'd lost Peter at that stage, it would have cost so much money. I was driving at 120 kilometers per hour. The bus at 80. That's it, go on now! And then, woof, it goes into the bus, and I thought that all the people in the front were going to jump out of the bus. That's how scared they were looking, because this change of speed was very surprising. But I stopped, just at their feet. This is one of my favorite stunts in my whole life, in my whole career. One of the most interesting scenes is, for me is actually the, the throwing of the three minis out of the coach while going through the Alps. And of course we had to shoot that uh, from the side of the mountain and also at the bottom of the mountain. And I volunteered uh, to be on one of the cameras at the bottom. And I couldn't help reflecting at the time that, hey, this was rather an unwise thing to do in some ways because when the cars were thrown out of the van, it was anybody's guess how they would fall and where they would finish up. And as the thing came hurtling down towards me, I couldn't help reflecting that in a previous film, I had already been taken to hospital after being hit by an aeroplane, believe it or not. And I suddenly thought, I got away with that one. And it would be a bit, bit much now if the thing that finally flattened me was a mini. I would have loved to take a mini with me when all the shooting was done. But the movie wasn't finished and everything went back to England. So I don't really know what happened to them. If they are in a museum or if the brand got them back. I regret I didn't manage to get one. Does he really need all this equipment? He says he does. We end up buying over 30 minutes. They were a, a, 
uh, six real ones and a dozen fake ones. I think we smashed about 20, 30 of them. There's been all sorts of reports of hundreds and 30 and 10, but that's how many minutes there were. We kept replacing them, which is why we got through so many. How many cars we got left, Bill? A couple of Charlie. Every car had a <laughs> dent or a ding or a bang on it, but none of them were written off. The six real minis all survived. Not a single one survived. If it had, I'd have kept it. a not a conservative ending for a film. That's what I loved about it. It was the unexpected. That was the great idea. There was no idea. There was no idea. There was no idea. Originally, there were something like five endings written. It was a great idea to have Mafia take the gold back. They all go to the bank with the gold in Switzerland, deposit it, and Michael Caine goes up to see the bank manager who has this huge desk with a big revolving chair and as the chair turns around it's the head of the mafia and he thanks Michael Caine for the deposit. <laughs> the ending was more of an inadvertency than a plan. And I went over to Hollywood to sit down with Evans and Peter Bard to discuss what we would do and on the way over I had an idea and it was in some ways a rather self-serving idea but it was a fun idea. It was the cliffhanger ending. We just didn't have an ending. So we made an ending, nothing. Michael Dealey, who was a good friend by then, uh, he conceived of the ending on the airplane coming over and put it in front of me. And I said, yeah, Michael, why not? And that, that became a classic. And it became one of the classic scenes of all time in England. One of the things I didn't like was the cutting off, and it's a, I've got a great idea. Bang. And we got a lot of sla uh, flack for that. People didn't like that ending like that. Everybody thought it was really awful, because, I mean, they, I think it was they were running out of money, they wanted to end it in the Alps. It was shot with such verve. The music, the actual aerial photography, everything about it, the playing of the actors, which was done on, here in London, really made it one of the great endings of all time. Nobody move. The last scene inside the bus was probably the most fun we had in the whole movie. Soaked in beer, soaked in drink. Oh, you can see it. You, you see when everyone gradually picked up. It was a great day. It was a great day. It's a fit ending to the film. The way the film, the second film, would have opened. The gold's at one end, the we're at the other. The gold would have actually gone over the edge. And he leans forward and switches the engine on. And we sit there for eight, nine, 10, 12 hours while all the petrol runs out. And that brings us back up. And the Corsican Mafia have been waiting all this time at the bottom for this thing to come off so they, because they knew the gold was on it. The next film would have been about Michael Caine and his gang um, trying to recover the girl from the Mafia and we chase them all the way through the French Riviera trying to get the gold back. So that was three months on the French Riviera I lost there. What would I have thought of to get Charlie and the gang out of the bus? Uh. Calling the United uh. States Marines. <laughs> had a very good idea for the music, and he chose Quincy Jones, which is an American, um, not the sort of person you'd identify with the, with the sort of project, really, because it's such a British project. It has always fascinated me, Every, from everything from, from, you know, Hale of Rue Britannia to uh, Spotted Dick Stodge. <laughs> he came over to England, and he was here for a while, and he very quickly got into the spirit of the thing. Um, there was an evening when, 
Cockney songs were being sung by Michael Caine. And... He sang things like, my old man's a dustman, <laughs> he wears a dustman's hat. So he went through all these with great relish and Jones was sort of nodding his head. He was completely, it was completely new to him, all this stuff. And he says, what is that and, and why is that? And I said, well, it's the way Cockneys talk and rhyming slang which is changeable, I said, all the time. The song Get a Blooming Move On was really just one of those silly things that, that Quincy would say to me, what does apple and pears mean, uh, the apples and pears? And I said, steers. And then I gave him a whole list of things, you know, like peck and rye means tyre, you know, and daisy roots means boots. I was amazed because it was a very British film with very uh, uh, patriotic singing and football and that, you know self-preservation society and to get this great black american jazz musician to do it he just used to fall about because he comes from america where they had no idea what this was and he said well let's do a song like that it was quince's idea actually he said, what a great idea, let's string them all together. Which was very easy for me, because I come from the East End of London, where people, you know, speak like that. A lot of Michael's character's culture went into Quincy's head, and that's how he was able to write such a perfect English-type music. We started to talk about Cockney slang, and that registered right away, because as a jazz musician, uh, Jazz musicians, the beboppers, they had more slang than anybody. And, it's, and it also comes from a slave thing or a prison thing, I think, in, uh, in London. It's for prisoners in prison to be able to speak to each other without the warders knowing what's going on. And, and once the warders find out, they, they change it. He liked the association with Cockneys, he liked all the rhyming slang, and he loved the summer singing that Michael Caine could do and they got on very well. We call ourselves the Celestial Twins because we found out from our mothers that we were born at exactly the same time. Once we found out we were a Celestial Twins, something happened, you know, it really did, and it happened naturally, it very, very uh, uh, organically. Quincy, to this day, will still greet me. When, when we see each other in LA, I go for our birthday. Very first thing, he'll, he'll go straight into some rhyming slang that he's learned. Usually wrong. Uh, watch the boat on the ice cream when he checks out the bristles on, on the Richard. <laughs> you know, what did I say? But he always, what about this one? Uh, watch the face when he checks out the bristles on the Richard with Richard III, the bird, you know. He loves rhyming, he's got me rhyming slang. And he wrote a whole song about it. Well, ice cream freezes geezer. Can't you for Quincy, uh, they thought it had great character to it. And since then, it's become, a, as you know, a bit of a cult, this song. And uh, I still don't know what it means, really. It's just a bunch of uh, rhyming slang. East End phrases. We had a dinner for Beckham here, and Beckham was telling me he's the one that, that, that uh, filled me in on that the audience is singing that song at the soccer games every year. I had no idea. I won an Ivor Novello last year, and a lot of the kids were teasing me. They said, there's no way that anybody but a Brit could have written Self-Preservation Society. I said, well, guess again. But I thought Quincy did an incredible job of it, considering he was writing in about 10 different blooming styles, you know, and none of which were his. When you're dealing with Michael Caine and Noel Coward, you better be dealing with, with, with a Brit approach, you know. And um, I was very happy and honored that I got a chance to do a film that represented the country. People have often said, is it Michael Caine singing on the end of the song? I mean, I don't know if it's Michael singing or not. It sounds like it. I'll have to ask him. Maybe you could ask him. Well, it was just a gang of us, you know. Yeah, we all sang it. And uh, um, he didn't need singers because they, they weren't a choir, hardly. <laughs> well, we recorded it out at Olympic. Uh, at the same time the Stones were doing uh, Sympathy for the Devil at Night, we were in the, in the studio in daytime scoring the film. I also think that the, the final scene in the film when Charlie turns round and says, Hang on a minute, lads. 
I've got a great idea. And then you get this tiny little riff of Quincy's music. I mean, it was just a beautiful little piece of editing which shows the kind of optimism. It's part of that Charlie theme, which was, there's no such thing as defeat. You can find a way through everything. Uh. Gives the audience uh, a feeling that, you know, they're going to somehow get their way out of this. On days like these, when the skies are blue, and fields are green. We needed a lyrical song, you know, as, as a, a sort of an overall theme before we got into the drama. The brief was to write a song that made uh, the Italian Riviera look irresistible. You know, just one of those gorgeous, sunny, tinted songs, you know, that you hear, Neapolitan songs, you think, oh my God, I'd love to be in Italy now. We just followed our instincts and uh, we wrote this, uh, I thought it was a lovely song for, for, uh, for Matt Monroe. Matt Monroe loved the song. He used to sing it all the time in his act, sang it whenever he could. He was very proud of that song. He sang it beautifully and he particularly loved those lines, while your eyes played games with mine. He always thought that was very romantic. While your eyes played games with mine. It just clicked. It just clicked and Don has it. The, the, the skills and, and the, 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 the ability to just go anywhere in a lyric, you know, I love that, because you never know what's going to take you. You have to open up your soul. My sister Adele speaks Italian fluently, and we thought it was a good idea for there to be, you know, a couple of lines of this in Italian. And I just said, you know, if you could tell me what the opening lines are, you know, in English there, on days like these when skies are blue and fields are green, uh, could you translate that? And she did. It's not as easy as it sounds because it had to fit the music. I don't know. It's just, just a, it's a, it's a reaction of God's whispers. You just react to what you feel, you know, uh, of how it should go. There's so many choices to make in a film. When you're scoring a film, you can go so many ways, you know. Now, I do believe you've put on a little weight. Yes, well, uh, I've been in America, you see. It's the uh, bread in the hamburgers. Is that so? Yes. Well, I'm glad you're out. I'll be back. In spite of all the American influence on the film, it was not a success in America. In fact, it was a failure. 69 and 70 are the two lowest years in 20 years in film. And the Italian job was an import. The, the, the distributor, I had a very difficult time with distribution opening the film in New York. They didn't want to. The main poster was a picture of Mike Kane holding a machine gun in one hand, a cup of tea in the other, presumably to indicate his Britishness. It just didn't really make much sense. And I went to America to publicize it, and the poster was of a big gangster sitting there, like a mafia, and a naked woman in front of him. And I said to the people of Paramount, I said, why is there a naked woman there? There aren't any naked women in the picture. He didn't know it was Michael Caine. It looked like some uh, gangster, uh, you know, with the big machine gun and, and the girl's uh, model that they had gotten with the map. Nobody could make sense. What was that? That, that didn't mean anything. The mothers are not going to take the children to see a picture with naked women in it. And men who go to see a naked woman, there aren't any. They're going to be disappointed. It's very sort of un-American, the film, which is why it remains here such a great hit and perhaps would never be such a hit there. Americans couldn't understand much of the dialogue. I have a cup of tea ready. And I even advocated facetiously that we put subtitles under the dialogue. It's like the black hole of Calcutta in here. Shout it, Arthur. Some English colleagues at Paramount were outraged that someone would put English subtitles on an English picture. But there were lots of problems with Americans understanding the, the accents at that period. If it were a John Wayne picture, a Kirk Douglas picture, the whole company would be on top of it. A Michael Caine picture? Uh, what do we need it for? That was the attitude. They didn't utilize all the great talent that they had and, and punch up that it was, it was about these little cars that no one at that time was really familiar with. So people didn't understand what the heck is this movie. It hurt when you work so hard on something and feel so good about it that you pull something off 
and you don't get the, the backing, it, it hurts. I really believe that children uh, from now on are going to see this film and embrace it and take it to their hearts. And I only wish that Peter Collinson and, and all of the others that have gone, Sir Noel Coward and everyone that's already passed, that they were here to enjoy that and share in that. They would be so happy. My father passed away before really it sort of really rose to the, the massive cult status that it is. He always loved it as a film, always thought it was a great film, always cheered him up, make him smile when he used to watch it, but really never, uh, never got to see the success that it, it, it finally reached. Peter wasn't quite 41 when he died. He died very, very young. We were all living in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, and uh, he had just finished one movie and was going for his checkup for insurance for another movie that he was starting. Uh, he came home from the doctor and said to me, he just wants me to hang on, he wants to ring me about something, but neither of us had any idea there was anything wrong. And when they did ring him, they said they couldn't insure him because they'd found he had cancer quite badly. And we were quite stunned because he actually he wasn't ill. He wasn't ill at all. We'd spent the year before that in Australia with William Holden making The Earthling, and uh, he was in fine form, looked well. I don't know whether it was being told he had cancer or whether the cancer really was desperately fast, but from the day he was told, he lived 12 weeks and died in St John's Hospital not quite 41, too early. the feeling of the 60s, a very optimistic period, um, quite dashing, um, a lot of fun. Being remembered to greater wealth than anything else, so I feel like the wealthiest man in the world celebrating it. Well, I'm not amazed that people are still talking about it 40 years later because it it does kind of stand out in that genre. And people have had masses of films and still that's one that's got a particular kind of room in their hearts for. It's a question of prestige. I can see now a kind of nostalgia for it that people have, and for youngsters, um, it's history. I mean, a friend of mine brought his kids around, and one was six and one was three, and I opened, I tell you, they came to lunch on a Sunday, and I opened the door and these two little boys said to me, you're only supposed to blow the bloody door. And I went, yeah. Very funny. <laughs> it lasts, there's another generation. It's just such an amazing memory, it really was, because it felt very special. You know, you're not sure why, and you're too busy to really reflect on that, but it's, it felt very special. We won, didn't we? And The Italian Job was such a terrific landmark movie that to see it again also reminds you of your youth a little bit. We all thought we were making a, a very, very pleasant English movie. It's the chemistry between the audience and those little Mini Coopers. That's it. Well, a spectacular nature of the car chases that, that, that really did work. We never, ever thought that it would become the film that it has become. La part, the power of the English humor, the exceptional cast, everything was built to make a success. It's a film that could take place today. Audiences uh, just lap it up. Very nice. Was something of the moment, of the period. It was at once a social satire some, with some brilliant strokes in it. I think the film has lasted for a time because it has a very English sense of humor. It is so quintessentially British. There's a picture of the Queen in it, sir. There's the cheekiness, really, 
of all the people involved. Morning, lads. It has a, a smoothness that runs through it of fun. We were just zipping about, being funny. I could eat the whole star. And I think it was a film of its time. It came at a time when the English films were pretty awful. And this was something special. Everything about it, it just, it's almost magical. It is a work of genius. I think it's, it's the patriotism and the fun of it. Try putting your foot down, Tony. They're really getting rather close. Mm. And the adventure. It's every adventure that a young man wants to do. It's believable. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> it's just non-stop, end-to-end. Just doesn't give you a minute's rest. It's a great film. It's a superb journey. Any new kids coming up, we watch that film and get fun out of it. Shorten the sleeves, will you, love? I'm not a gorilla. It was about a bunch of losers, wasn't it, really? They are not so stupid as they look. And you know, the British love the underdog. You pick them, don't you? I think it's got a big future, as well as a big past. Very, very honored to be, be associated with this Sam and become uh, authentic Brit. <laughs> Bloody foreigner. It's fun. It's just having great fun. <laughs> <laughs> And completely irresponsible. <laughs> but remember this. When your back's against the wall, the impossible is possible. And there's no better example than the Italian job. Yeah, right,